Because that's true, what we just sing about, we can sing that he's a good, good father this morning. You suffer a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night and you tell. That you're pleased in that I am never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. Deeper 
sing that out again. Jeremiah says, for I know the plans that I have for you. Plans to give you a future and a hope. And we know that no matter where we're on, where we're at in the, road, in the journey that God has us on, he's perfect in all his ways. And he'll complete what he begins. So let's sing this out together. You're perfect. You're perfect in all of your ways. You're perfect in all of your ways. You're perfect in all of your ways to us. We believe in Lord, you are perfect in all of your ways. You're perfect in Yes, you are perfect in all of your ways to
Well, good morning, everyone. And we are glad that you're here for the second message of Uphill Habits. Uh, last week, we began this uh, series talking about uh, putting God first, which I, I, I don't think we can underestimate uh, putting him and his things first in our life. Can I get an amen to that? Aristotle wrote, we are what we repeatedly do. And so since it's the beginning of the year, uh, we're doing a series on uphill habits. Why, why, why uphill habits? Well, at the beginning of a year, it's kind of like a time for us to, you know, kickstart or get a fresh start. And we do that with, you know, resolutions. And resolutions are, are really hopes, and there's nothing wrong with hopes. But hoping is not a great strategy. Uh, and, and so hoping is a motivator. But the habits are the strategy to, to put those hopes uh, into practice in our life. Another way to say what Aristotle said is we form habits and then our habits form us. And so habits are very important because they end up dictating how our life uh, turns out and, and what it looks like. And so we're starting this year with four basic God habits. The first one was uh, putting God first in our life. And the reason we called this this, if you look at your introduction, it says most people have uphill hopes, and that motivates us, but the, the reason that resolutions don't work, because we have downhill habits. In fact, I, I don't know who, who said this, but I've heard this. Uh, I've heard John Maxwell say this. Everything in life worthwhile is uphill. Now, the reason... We have downhill habits is because going down the hill is easy. <laughs> going up the hill is more difficult. And it's not impossible. It's just everything worthwhile is a struggle compared to just going with life and going with the flow and, and taking the easy route. In fact, it says in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, if you put that verse up on the screen... I want us to say the first five words of this verse together. Ready? Fix your attention on God. Focus. Fix our attention on God. And what does it say? You'll be changed from the inside out. See, the reason resolutions don't work is we try to modify ourselves from the outside in, but when we focus on God first, he changes us from the inside out. And then what happens? Look at this. You'll be changed from the inside out, readily recognize what he wants you to do, and quickly respond to it. As soon as God speaks to us from his word, in his spirit, we should do what he says. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity. Boy, what a true statement about our culture. God brings out the best of you develops well-formed maturity in you. In fact, I believe that God is the only one that can bring the best out of us. Can I get an amen to that, church? So that's why we started this year with 21 days of prayer and fasting, uh, because we want to put God first. We want to hear from him. We don't want more culture in our life. We want less of our culture in our life. We want more of Jesus in our life. Amen, church? And so it's like, well, I, I didn't start that. Well, this is the third week. Jump in today. Deny yourself of something that the God is speaking to you about. Uh, and, and I'm going to talk in this message later on about how much the media and how much of what we hear impacts how we think and how we feel. And so we need to guard our hearts with the truth, pour God's word in. And that's what prayer and fasting is about. We, Cindy and I had some situations this week, and after those circumstances and situations happened that we weren't planning for, and we would, quite frankly, if we knew they were going to happen, we would have avoided them. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? I'm like, boy, if I'd have known that was going to happen, I'd have gone around that. And after we got through it, we noticed how different we responded to it because we have been praying and fasting. And if it would have been just regular who we normally are, there would have been some venom coming out. I'm telling you, it was like really not a good situation. And so because we were doing this with you, the 21 days of prayer and fasting, we 
It's like God had control, and we didn't even recognize until we walked away from the circumstance. We're like, man, we saw God in that because I didn't respond like I, ready, normally do. And that's what the praying and fasting about. You say, well, I, I missed the first two weeks. Jump in and get the last week. Can I get an amen to that? I mean, God can do something in your life in a week. So jump in because when we're praying and fasting, it, it, it's simply this. You can write this down. Whatever you starve, it dies. But whatever you feed, it thrives. So if we feed the wrong attitude, if we feed the wrong mindset, it's going to thrive. But if we starve it and we feed the spirit, it's going to thrive. So the things that we don't want to be controlling us, when we're praying and fasting, we, we starve those things and they die in our life. And we feed the things we want to have active in our life. So today we're going to look at the second uphill habit. The first one was, as I said, don't underestimate it, putting God first. The second has to do with our thoughts. If you look at your notes, number one, it says controlling my thoughts. Controlling my thoughts. You might want to jot this down. We will never change our lives until we change the way we think. We will never change our lives until we change the way we think. In fact, I'm going to talk about the theology of this in Scripture because I don't want somebody to walk away from saying, oh man, Pastor Downs' sermon today, it was really just about positive thinking. And I do believe that we should be careful on how much negativity we allow that gets in our midst and into our mind because sometimes you just have toxic negative people around you and you wonder why there's no positive things in your life. You need to like Maybe shuttle some of those people and say, well, I, you know, I, I wake up grumpy every morning, and I'm sorry you're married to them. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. That was a quick one, wasn't it? you got to be listening. Look at this. Look at what Solomon writes in Ecclesiastes 10 about our thoughts. He said, wise thinking leads to right living, but stupid thinking leads to wrong living. I don't know if you've ever done this, but I can look back in my life, and I'm sure you can yours too, and look back at about two or three or four moments where a pivotal thing happened in your life. I mean a total life change pivot that impacted you, your family, your future, and everything. You don't have 30 of them. You probably got about two, three, or four. And all of those decisions were preceded And all those life changes were preceded by a change in your thinking first. When I was in the world and thinking that God did not have a future for me, God got a hold of my mind one night, and the only right thought I had that night was simply this. I could go home to my parents' house because they love me. I know that. I didn't think that night, oh, I'm going to end up being a pastor and I'm going to this. No, it was just the right thinking that I knew there were two people in this world that loved me and it was my mother and father. And no matter what I'd done, and it was, I was ashamed of my life, I knew I could go there and they would love me. They would not, and let me tell you, if you know, if you know my parents, they, they weren't going to approve of my life. That's not, when I say love, they weren't going to say, oh, it's okay. They were like, Tommy, you got to repent. I mean, it, was, it, it wasn't easy going home. But I knew they had my best interest at heart. I had no idea what that decision at 21 was going to lead to, but it started with thinking right about going to my parents' house because I had been thinking wrong about that for years that they were the ones that were keeping me from having fun. That was wrong thinking, and it led to a horrible life. But right thinking put me on the right path. It did. And you can think back in your life to where wrong thinking put you on a wrong path and where it led led you to, you probably regret to this moment like I do. But right thinking puts you on a right path. 
and led to a destination that you're glad you got on that road. Can I get an amen? That's some good preaching right there. Okay, there's a couple people that think that was good preaching. So uh, you probably think it's great preaching if I say, close your Bibles, let's pray and go home. But we need to look at the theology of this, because I, and then we're going to get practical. But let's look at the theology of this, because Solomon very clearly said that our thinking matters, and he was the wisest person ever to live. But the first, thing I want, first point I want to make under controlling our thought is that everything begins with a thought. Everything. Everything begins with a thought. We don't do things unless we first thought about those things. Romans 12, 2. Says, don't copy the behavior and customs of, of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Dr. Falwell used to say it to, I, I mean, almost every sermon I've heard him preach he, especially to pastors, he said, I always give God the first hour of my day, and then he takes care of the rest. I give him my first hour, and he arranges my schedule for the rest. But what he was saying is that he was aligning his thoughts and his mindset with God in the first hour. You, you might say, man, I can't do that. You give him the first 15 minutes. Give him the first something of your day and see if it doesn't change the way your life turns out that day. Give them the first opportunity to get to your mind because if we give the news our first thoughts, if I, I, the first of our day, if we turn over, and I love technology, I love what it does for us, but boy, there are times where you can turn over that phone and look at it, and after you look at that phone for just 10 seconds, you go to try to have your time with God, but you're already, your mind's already, it's already gone. Right. Amen, it's already churning. It's already, oh, I got a this, I got a that, I got a, you know, it's already off to the races. And even though we try to have our quiet time, whatever you call it with the Lord, our mind has already, I mean, it's out of the gate and it's running down the road of the day. Right. It's already gone. So be careful what you do first, because everything begins with a thought. Secondly, what we think determines how we feel. What we think determines how we feel. On Wednesday, uh, the Victory Bible class had a potluck on Saturday. On Wednesday, three days before the potluck, the church office was fielding phone calls about canceling the potluck for Victory Bible class. Why? Because the media said on Saturday we were going to get eight inches of snow. And there was a winter warm storming on, on Wednesday. And if you listen to everything the news media says, we better just climb, you know, dig a hole, climb into it, and die because disaster is right on the horizon of all of our lives. If it's not going to happen from North Korea, it's going to come from uh, it's going to come from China. It's going to come from Russia. It's going to come from the illegal immigrants. It's, I mean, our world is just a time bomb. Tick, 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 tick. And it's going to blow up any minute. And oh, no. And it's the weather. And it's this. And we've never had storms like this. And we've never had this. like. And yes, we have. They just, everybody in the news media only has 15-second memories. Because I remember back in as a kid when the snow was this tall. So we've actually had mild winters for a long time. Okay? Oh, but these, these calamities and these wars and these this and these that. I know it's coming to a fever pitch because why? We have media now telling us at every second it's the storm of the century. It's the, this. It's the war of the end all world. And... It's always the end of the world, right? And it gets us so worked up, we want to cancel a potluck three days before the weather even happens. And guess what? It didn't happen. But we spend all that time and energy and nervousness, oh, whoa, whoa, what if it happens? Are you kidding? See, that's what it does. we got to be careful what comes into our mind. Because what we think determines how we feel. So listen to what Paul writes in Philippians 4. Finally, brothers, 
Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, that means noble. Whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable. If there's any moral excellence, if there's any praise, dwell. Think about these things. Do what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me and, ready, the God of peace will be with you as your pastor. This is what I want for your life. I want the God of peace ruling over your life instead of the God of stress. I want the God of peace ruling your life. And let me tell you, God's got it under control. Even when our plans don't pan out, he's got it under control control. He does. And some of us are like, oh yeah, God's got under control. I wish he'd hand me the steering wheel. No, we don't know what he knows. His ways and his thoughts are higher than ours. He's got better plans for us than we have for ourselves. Amen? So here's what I want you to do. Since I want you to have peace this week, as you, I, I, you don't have to do this. I want you to filter the media for a week. I want you to filter it. That means I want you to turn off CNN. I even want you to turn off Fox. Yeah. Because we know that's God's channel. Give me a break. Okay? Let's just filter what comes in and replace it with things that are noble, with things that are commendable with things that are life-altering, with things that are eternal. And see, in one week, just filter it. Filter your use of the Internet for one week. One week. You're like... <laughs> filter Instagram. I promise we will not Instagram you as a church this week. We're not going to do it because we're going to filter it. The only thing you're going to get from us this week is reminders on what to pray about, and what verse to read every morning. That's it. That's all you're going to get from us. Everything else, we're going to filter it, because why? I want us to turn it, dial it back, and give a chance for God to put his truth into our minds. Just dial it back a little. If you, if you start breaking out in hives, okay, then, then let your spouse help you with it a little about how much you, you, you allow in, but just filter your media for a week and see if by, the, by next Sunday if the God of peace isn't ruling over your life more than this week, more than the past week. See if it doesn't work. Put it to the test. So what we, everything begins with a thought. What we think determines how we feel. Number three, our thoughts determine our destiny. Now, this is more than just positive thinking. Let me read this verse. Paul wrote, writes in Romans 8, verses 5 and 6, those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that are pleasing to the Spirit. So let your sinful nature, so letting your sinful nature controlling your mind leads to death, but letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. Some of us this week, you need to turn off the media, you need to dial it back so that the God of peace can help you over your God of fear. Because I can't believe how many Christians are just ruled by the fear of what if such and so happens. What if? And we're worried about our kids, and we're worried about our grandkids, and we're worried about what is the doctor going to say, and, and we just live in constant fear. Well, where's the peace of God? Where's the peace of God? And so that, those thoughts are not from the, the Lord. It's, it's been said this way, if you sow a thought, you reap an action. If you sow an action, you reap a habit. If you sow a habit, you reap a lifestyle. You sow a lifestyle, you reap a destiny. So I want to give you a ways to, to test this, to put it to test in your life. And here's the practical, five ways of practicing, uh, mastering this habit of controlling your thoughts. The first one is find a plan to control my thoughts. Find a plan to control my thoughts. Now, my, my grandson is six weeks old and one day. 
And you know what? I'm always already, I'm not going to say worried because I just did a whole thing about worry. So I'm going to change it and do the Baptist thing. You know what I'm concerned about? <laughs> Is my grandson's his access to all the craziness on the internet. And he's six weeks old. And I'm already concerned about it. Because I know, I had girls. Those of you that have boys, you better be doing a lot of praying and fasting. Because the internet can steal their soul in a heartbeat. There's so much danger on there. There's so much danger on there. And I mean, when you, when you're, if, you, if you're going to fast from the media and from the news channels and from, the, you know, watching the disasters on the weather channel for a week, then, then have your kids, if you've got kids in teenage years or something, have them, have them just dial it back on killing people for a week on, the, on, on, their, on their games. Just dial it back for a week. And I know the parents are like, yeah, yeah, if we're going to suffer, they're suffering too. You know, just dial it back. There's just so much out there that is dangerous to our children. It is. And so find a way to control our thoughts means that we have to, we can't just dial it back and do nothing. We need to put something in its place. Here's what Hebrews 4.12 says. The, for the word of God is living and effective. It's active. It's powerful. It actually is. The word of God is breathing. It's alive. It, it has effect. To whenever we read it, it has effect when we give our heart to it. And it's sharper than any dual-edged sword, double-edged sword, penetrating as far as the separation of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It's able to judge the ideas and thoughts of the heart. So, so what is God's remedy for controlling our thoughts? The plan is to put God's word in there, to read the Bible. Let me say it another way. Read the Bible. Let me say it in a new way. Read the Bible. Let me say it in a totally relevant way. Read the Bible. That's why years ago we put the one-year Bible reading plan in, on our website and and access. We have a, a Bible plan. You can go to the Welcome Center and get it. And 15 minutes a day, 10 to 15 minutes a day, you can read through all of God's Word in one year. But we don't want you to do it legalistically. We, we want you to discipline and give God the first of your day and give Him access to your heart because He will put truth in there to combat what you don't know what's coming that day, and He knows what's coming that day. And when we give him a chance to do that, he'll get us ready for something we don't even know is coming. We don't even know it's coming. And he'll get us ready. So find a plan to control your thoughts. Read the Bible. Secondly, find a place to think my thoughts. You have to have a place to unload, to offload, to take that stress and take those fears and take that junk that we collect and off dump it and get it off. I don't know if you realize this. I'm going to get scientific with you. They, some, of the, some of this stuff really intrigues me. I didn't know this because I didn't listen in science class, but when I started uh, scuba diving and my life depended on it, I started listening. And it's a difference, huh? Amen, Amen. And so God has designed us in such a wonderful way that we are covered in this thing called skin. And and. Believe it or not, your skin is this amazing creation of God that enables you to just don't elbow your spouse right now. It enables you to off gas all day long. And you're el you're uh, yeah, see, he's talking about you, honey. Stop off gassing in church. No, that, that's not what I'm talking about. We breathe in, right? We take a breath, and what comes in is... 20.9% oxygen and 79.1% nitrogen. That's what, that's what air is made up of. And we breathe that in. And your lungs take 
that oxygen and that nitrogen, and it fuels our blood. Isn't that amazing? And our lungs, the blood vessels go through, and it, it breathes life into our blood, and it oxygenates the blood because the life is in the blood, but the blood without oxygen is dead. Yeah. And so it's how it keeps us alive. But in the process of us breathing, we breathe out carbon dioxide, and we keep nitrogen bubbles in our blood and circulatory system. And so God has covered us from head to toe with this thing called skin, and that nitrogen seeps out of our skin so we don't collect it, and it pool and turn into bubbles in our joints, which become very, very painful. It's called the bends when you're diving. And God's made us to constantly off-gas. Every time we breathe in, our skin is breathing out the nitrogen so that we don't keep it in our blood system. And the reason for that is because by keeping it in, it becomes poisonous to our system. And if we keep all the stuff that's going on in this world inside our system, our heart, our soul, it will poison us. We need a place to off-gas. We need a place to take that burden and just, just dump it, just Take that wheelbarrow and just unload it. And you know what that place is? It's called prayer. Amen. That's the place where we just take our fears and our worries and our stress and our burdens and we just say, oh, no, I don't want to do that in my prayer life. I don't want to burden Jesus. He, in his word, he says, come, burden me. Yes, he wants to carry our burdens because he knows those burdens will break us down. Amen. He wants us to off-gas. He wants us to have that conversation. You know, I'm, I've, I've been joyfully married for over 31 years to Cindy, but if she walks around with a troubled face and I say, honey, what's wrong with you? What's going on? And she says, I, just, I don't want to burden you. I'll be like, what do you mean you don't want to burden me? Man, we got this relationship. We got this love thing. Of, of course I want to share in your burdens. So when we do that with God, I don't want to trouble you. He treats as if we're not in relationship with him because he is with us every day to carry our load for us. Can I get an amen? He does. You're not going to overburden Jesus Christ. He already, came, he already paid for all your burdens. He wants to carry them for you. So unload in prayer. Connect with him. I say this to young couples. When they come in before they're married, they come in for you know, premarital talks. Okay, and I sit down and I, I do the real deal with them. I say, now listen, this is what's important. You need to not go to bed angry. That's important, isn't it? Yeah, because the next day you wake up and you're still angry. You forgot what it's about. You're just angrier. And after a week, you just, you just want to, you know, you better be sleeping with one eye. You go a whole week. One eye open, you know. Like, you really don't need those kitchen utensils in the bedroom. Put them back in the kitchen. You don't need that big old frying pan in the bed, no. But see, that's what happens. So the Lord says, hey, deal with what's making you angry before you go to bed. Amen. Yeah. And then tomorrow's a fresh start. That's a good thing. Here's another thing I tell young couples. Every day. It doesn't, doesn't need to be an hour. It doesn't need to be two hours. And, and they look at me like I'm crazy because, you know, they're young and in love. And, they, you know, they're just staring at each other. It's going to be, oh, when we get married, it's going to be like this all the time. And I sit there. Up. <laughs> yeah. And I don't want to burst their bubble. Life will do that. <laughs> and I tell them simply this. I'm like, listen, I know it's hard to understand now, but there's going to become a time where you're going to be dealing with so much responsibility, you're going to forget about each other. So make sure you make it a point to connect every day. Yes. To look at each other in the face without, I don't mean look at each other. Okay, commercial, what were you saying, honey? <laughs> That's not connecting, isn't that right, ladies? That's not connecting. Not connecting. Okay, right, oh, between emails, huh? What'd you say, hon? I'm not typing now. No, nope, not connecting. I mean, put everything down. Focus on each other and actually 
Hear what the other person is saying, not just the words. Hear what they're saying. Connect your hearts with each other. You know how you do that? Typically, it's, it's where you're just, bleh. you unload with each other. That's what we're there for. We're here, there to share the joys and the sorrows of life, to share the burdens together. Two are better than one, what Scripture says. Amen? So God has given us this privilege called prayer to unburden ourselves with him. And we need to connect each day. It says in Isaiah 26, you will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. And then in Colossians, Paul writes, think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. That's what we do when we pray. We turn down the volume of the world in our life and we turn up the volume of God's voice in our life. And that's what we need to do. Third practical thing is find a person to stretch my thoughts. You know, when we confess our sins to God, he forgives us and we become his children. And that's called salvation to us. That's, that's how a person is saved, by repenting, by turning to God and saying, I, I need your forgiveness. I know that's what you went to the cross and died for, that it wasn't for something you had done, it was for what I did. But James chapter 5, verse 16 tells us that in order to be set free, though, we, we, we confess our sin to Jesus for forgiveness, but we confess our sins to one another so that we can find freedom from those things. We need each other. He says, confess to God gives you salvation. But confessing our sin to one another gives you spiritual relationship and renewal and, and a brotherhood and a sisterhood in the faith. And he says, that's where you find freedom. So it says in Hebrews 10, verse 24 and 25, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do. They've actually, another version says, they've made it a habit, but instead encouraging one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. The reason that we need each other even more, and he wrote this 2,000 years ago, the writer did, he said, because the world is so crazy. I don't know about you, I find myself less and less at home in our culture and more an alien in the world I live in, don't you? Well, that's why we need each other, church. We need each other. We can't just habitually say, well, I'm not going to be in a relationship with those people at church, and, and I, I'm going to just... I, God doesn't want you to be a lone ranger. And so how do I do this? Get in a small group. Our small groups are starting out in February, first Sunday in February, but they're not just on Sunday. If you want to begin a small group, like, like Pastor Sean was talking about a foodie group, I'm like, I want in. I want in the foodie group. So whenever you do it, I expect me to show, man, because I, I want to go be part of the foodie group. Uh, but some of you, I, it doesn't matter. Take what you're already doing and turn it into a group of encouragement where you can encourage one another, you can add scripture and prayer to it and encourage one another to take the next step in your faith. ESPN, and you got a small group. you got a small group because we need to do life together. We need each other. Get in a small group is starting in February. The next one is find a purpose to land my thoughts. Find a purpose to land my thoughts. If God were sitting in your life right now, right next to you, Here's what he would say. He would say, let me settle what happened yesterday and let's move forward into the future. Amen. That's what he would say. He would say, let me settle what happened yesterday because he's the only one that can deal with it. I can't settle it. It's, it's yesterday. I can't climb back into yesterday and fix it. It's gone. It's out of my control. So he says, let him settle the past and let's move forward forward together into the future. That's what Jesus would say to you right now. So we need to have a purpose to land our thoughts on. In Romans 12, 2, the key verse for this whole study, do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by what? Renewing of your mind. 
so that we may deter, then discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Amen. I believe that you will find out and the, the purpose for which you were made, you will find in growth track. You will find, and, and if you took growth track today, uh, this morning, or you have an opportunity to take it this afternoon at 4 o'clock, you will find out your personality profile. You will take a spiritual ass gifts assessment test, and you will find out why God made you and placed you here. Because if we don't know why God made us, we don't understand why why we're here in this world. And so the world says, well, you're here to drink as much uh, Bud Light as you can, and then you die. And by the way, you better be watching football, and your team better be winning while you're drinking at Bud Light, or else you're a loser. Right? That's what the world says. That's, it doesn't get any better than that. You got your beer, and your team wins. You're a winner. You've won at life. And then why do you go to work on Monday, even after your team wins, and you don't feel like a winner? Because what they've sold us is not true. Amen. That's not why you're here. You're not here just to consume. You're here to make a difference for eternity in other people's lives. Amen. And God has gifted you and given you a purpose in this life. And when you find that out in Growth Track, you're going to understand and life is going to make so much sense to you. And then the fifth thing, find a power to fuel my thoughts. We need a power that's beyond us. The Apostle Paul writes in Ephesians 3.20, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. Isaiah wrote 2,600 years ago. He wrote this about God. That his ways are higher than my ways. His thoughts, his plans for me are higher than my thoughts for myself. I can't even begin to understand what God wants. But just dream the most fantastic thing that you can. And God is above that. Because his thoughts and ways are above ours. Dr. Falwell used to say it this way to us pastors. He would say... If you don't have a BHAG, B-H-A-G, you can't be a, a pastor of faith. And what a BHAG was, was a big, hairy, audacious goal. Something that you believe God wants you to do, but you can't do it. That unless he moves heaven on your behalf, that's the only way it can come to pass. The only way. And the writer here in Ephesians says, God wants that for every single one of us. Amen. He wants us to have things happen in our life that are beyond our even understanding. How did this even happen? How did it happen? My daughters both graduated from Liberty University. And when I was 16 years old, my father took me to Lynchburg, Virginia to meet Dr. Falwell. And we got, uh, we got to his office and jumped in his big black suburban, and we rode down this uh, two-lane road. It was called Ward Road. It was a lane each way, and it was just a little country road with nothing on it, and there was a dirt road going up a hill, and we turned on that dirt road, and, and it felt like we were driving straight up. It was pretty, that's why he added a suburban, and then we went across a couple train tracks and stopped, and you could tell that he had made this trip many times because there was a big turnaround up there. And we got out of the truck, and there were weeds. It was, it was you know, early summer, and the weeds were tall. And, and uh, he said, this is Liberty Mountain. This is Liberty Mountain. Yes, sir. And I'm 16 years old, and all my infinite wisdom, I said, looks like a bunch of weeds to me. <laughs> looks like a bunch of weeds. Because that's what it was. There was nothing on the mountain but weeds and train tracks, okay? And my daughters graduated and lived on that mountain for four years, each of them, in dormitories that were not built. Amen. And that, that whole mountain that I saw with nothing on it is now littered 
was Liberty University, the largest Christian evangelical university in the world. Hallelujah. And Dr. Falwell didn't do that. God did that through him. Amen. He did that through him. I couldn't see it. But God put that vision in his heart. And God has a vision in your heart. And I think many times that vision is drowned out by what we listen to on the news. Amen. Right. And what we listen to are our, our negative coworkers right. and, and our, our neighbors that, you know, that they, they don't know enough to, you just shouldn't be listening to your neighbors most of the time. And we let all those voices and all, these, all this knowledge from the world drown out the vision God has in our life. And we need to start thinking right. We do. Say, how do I do that? Well, how about this? How about you, how about you go home this afternoon or... Maybe in your quiet time tomorrow, you write down some right things that God knows are true. How about you write down, God has uniquely and wonderfully made me. Yes, sir. God has given me a spouse. If you're blessed to be married, God has given me a spouse. Yes, and if you're a man, write down, I'm going to love my wife. With all of my heart, soul, I'm going to lay my life down for her. If you have a husband, I'm going to respect that man with everything that I am. If I have children, my children are going to do great things for God. They're going to do greater things for God than I ever did. God, if you bless me with grandchildren, I'm going to raise them to know you. I'm going to pour your truth into them. I am a light and a witness at my workplace. I, I am going to witness for you as I go to my workplace. And you write down true things. These are not fluffy things. These are true things about each and every one of us. And we need to write those down, and we need to read those out loud to ourselves every day to combat the garbage that's going to come our way and say, you're nothing, you can't change anything, your God isn't real. That's garbage. It's not true. Amen, it's not true. Jesus is real. And if we let his voice speak loud and clear to us, then his voice will speak through us to others loud and clear too. Hallelujah. And they'll see a difference. And they'll want to know, man, what is in you that I don't have? So in conclusion this morning, may we find victory in our thoughts. Now, Paul, I want to read this verse to you, these two verses. Because Paul wrote this, to the Corinthian church that was dealing, the, the Corinth church was known as the fleshly or the carnal church. They were very worldly. They had allowed the culture to infiltrate their thinking. And basically, Paul's two letters to them were, were full of rebuke and correction. Yeah. And he was trying to get them back to thinking right. Amen. And look at what he says. He says in 2 Corinthians 10, Verses 4 and 5, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. The wrong, wrong thinking, these strongholds in our spirit that have control of us, that keep us from moving forward with the Lord and for the Lord. He says, God's word has the ability to demolish those strongholds. But verse 5 he says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. Look at this, church. And we take captive into obedience every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Amen. This is the key yes, to right thinking. We have to take those thoughts and put them under the lens of God's word. Yeah. Say, are these things true? And if they're true, we need to thank them. If they're not true, we need to discard them like yesterday's garbage because they're going to affect who we are and how we think. And God wants us to think the way he thinks for us. Amen? Amen. He doesn't want us to think like the world thinks because the world says our God's not real and nothing can change. 
and everything's horrible, but God says, oh, no, I have a bright future. I got wonderful plans for each and every one of you. Plans to do good, not harm. Plans to do good. God wants to bless you, and God wants his peace to rule in your life. So let's give him the opportunity to do that by putting on right thinking. Bow your heads. Bow your heads right now. And the reason I have you do that is because this is an individual time for individual choice. But if you're here today and you would say, Pastor, Tom, there's some, there's some thoughts in my heart that I know don't measure up. They're not the truth. They're not what you talked about today. They're not thoughts that are there by God. They're the thoughts, though, that control me. Maybe your thoughts today that control you are that, that you've done something that's, or you're in a place that's unforgivable and unrecoverable and you could not be more wrong. Jesus Christ died on the cross for one kind of person and that person is called a sinner. He died for you. He loves you. He wants to forgive you. And if your thoughts today are that he can't do that for me, you need to change that thought to he wants to do it for you and he wants to do it for you right now. So if today you know there's some wrong thoughts that are controlling you, I want to pray a prayer of truth over you. I want to pray God's word over you today. And I want to ask God to start changing your thinking right now. And if you know that it is needed in your life, and you want to be included in this prayer, just slip your hand up and say, God, I need your truth. I need your thinking in my life. Upstairs and down, just lift your hands. Show it to God. Show God you want his thinking. Awesome. Let's pray together. Father, there are people here today, Lord, and they, they love you. They believe in you. But wrong thinking has invaded their heart, their mind. And Lord, they need your power to break these strongholds down and replace it with right thinking, that you love them, that you want to pour your blessing and peace into their life, and you want them to make a difference for you. Lord, as they live according to your purpose, you want them to experience fulfillment and the wonderment of life like never before. And Lord, by your spirit and by your power, make it so. And Lord, for those that today need to ask your forgiveness, I pray, Lord, that they would use words like this. Jesus, come into my life, forgive me. I surrender to you. I, I give my life to you completely. Thank you for dying on the cross to pay for my sin and saving me today. And Jesus holy name we pray if you pray with me church say amen this morning sing us out Christ alone cornerstone Christ alone.